Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Bland. I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement, Partnerships, and Events at Morehouse College. And I want to welcome you all to our webinar this evening. This is about National Men's Health Month, How Black Men Can Help Prevent Stroke and Dementia. On behalf of Morehouse College, Morehouse School of Medicine, and the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this topic is very important to me. Uh, we're going to be speaking with some uh, experts, but in my case, just two years ago, I had a mild stroke uh, that I almost did not notice and probably would not have changed my behavior because of. Um, during the beginning of the pandemic, I was still working in a K through 12 environment while counseling both students, teachers, faculty, and staff at our school. And uh, after having uh, some bouts with migraines and some uh, issues where I was very dizzy and, and, and had trouble with my vision, I finally went to the doctor who uh, had me go to my eye doctor, who then told me what had happened. Uh, basically, a blood vessel burst uh, just a little bit south of my brain. And, and unfortunately, uh, I had to have a bit of surgery behind my eye, but doing better now. A lot of that is due to some healthy living and some choices that I've made around making sure I take care of my blood pressure as well as uh, my, my personal health. But as we move on, I am honored in joining this important effort and looking at our looking forward to our conversation with Dr. Carls and Dr. Benson today. A little bit more for you. June is Mental Health Men's Health Month, uh, and we want to make sure that we talk about the risk to men for uh, high blood pressure, stroke, and dementia, and then the knowing your knowing your risk and the power of knowing your risk. As we move through this conversation today, we will have an opportunity to ask questions and get answers from the doctors who are on the panel uh, before we close. Tonight, you'll learn about important health issues that affect Black men, high blood pressure, which can cause stroke, heart disease, and dementia. High blood pressure is more common among Black adults, and more men have high blood pressure than women. The good news is you can take steps now to make sure that your blood pressure is in a healthy range or keep your numbers in a healthy range to, keep, to help prevent stroke and dementia later in life. You'll hear from two panelists this evening who are experts on the topic. They will share more information about risks and, more importantly, offer actionable steps you can take to stay healthy. We will also have plenty of time for you to ask questions. So without further ado, let me intro formally introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Richard Benson. Dr. Benson is Director of the Office of Global Health and Health Disparities at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Part of the U.S. National Institutes of Health, he is a leader in the fields of vascular neurology and health disparities research. His areas of research interest and expertise include health disparities in health equity research and minority community and global health. Our second panelist, who you'll be meeting later, is Dr. Raquel Quarles, a behavioral scientist and a professor of community health and preventative medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine. Her research interests and areas of expertise include prevention, risk reduction, and self-management of chronic diseases among Black Americans and underserved communities. Uh, we'll kick off Dr. Benson's discussion with a poll question, and there will be several chances to test your knowledge throughout the webinar. We'll pose a true-false question, take a few moments, and select your answer. The first question is, True or false, high blood pressure has been linked to stroke and dementia. I see some answers coming in. Let's give it a few more seconds. All right. It looks like most people got this correct. If you selected true, that's correct. Many years before you have a stroke or notice dementia, uncontrolled high blood pressure narrows your arteries, decreasing blood to your brain. So now I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Benson, who will speak more about the connection between high blood pressure, stroke, 
and dementia and the risks for black men. Dr. Benson, please take it away. Thank you, Sean. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you for uh, the warm introduction, uh, but also from the really compelling personal testimony that you gave us as well. And that sort of highlights why it's so important for us to, um, to have this discussion. Um, as a representative of the um, NIH National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, uh, I'm really excited about this uh, collaboration that we have here with Morehouse School of Medicine and Morehouse College. Uh, next slide. So we're gonna jump into it. Uh, heart disease and stroke are the first and the fifth leading causes of death in the United States. Each year, about 700,000 Americans have a stroke. Uh, so what that means is about every 45 seconds, someone has a stroke. So I want you to think about that during this presentation, the number of people that are actually having strokes here in the United States. Stroke is also the second leading cause of death worldwide. Um, actually, it's the number one cause of death in China, but worldwide it's the second leading cause of death. Uh, and it's also the leading cause of disability uh, here in the United States. And it's the leading cause of disability in other uh, countries as well. So it's really a global problem. Someone dies of a stroke every three minutes. Again, very compelling. Think about that every three minutes. So again, during this uh, webinar, just think of the number of people in this country that are going to die because of a stroke. Stroke also is an area of disparity. It's two times more common in Blacks compared to whites. Uh, the first study to look at the disparities in stroke was the Northern Manhattan Stroke Study, uh, which was a study that I had the um, uh, privilege of working on during my fellowship at Columbia University in New York. And we found that according to that study, stroke is two times more common in Blacks compared to whites, and it's 1.5 times more common in Hispanics compared to whites. So it's a big area of, of disparity. And I have here, uh, as a vascular neurologist, I like to show this when I'm talking to people, uh, just so that they have some context in terms of what's going on in the brain. I have here on the left of the screen an MRI. It's something called a diffusion weighted image. And we have a large left MCA stroke. And on the right of the screen, we have what's called an MRA, and that looks at the arteries in the brain. And we see this cutoff here on the left side. And this is a major artery, a vessel that's cut off. That blood vessel actually takes blood to the left side of the brain. So this stroke can be incompatible with life. And also it can cause major disability, like inability to speak in most people and weakness on the opposite side of the body. Next slide. This slide here, I have a, a CAT scan and a GRE uh, or gradient echo from an MRI. We have multiple micro hemorrhages, um, which can be seen in people with chronic uncontrolled high blood pressure, uh, and also other conditions can produce that as well. And, and this leads to large um, hemorrhages in the brain, as we can uh, see here on this CAT scan with this large low bar hemorrhage. Next slide. And all of these findings put you at risk for a stroke. So before we go on, I think it's important to know um, the symptoms of stroke. We need to know this so that we can um, act fast. So these are the signs that we have for stroke. And the key is the suddenness or the sudden onset of these uh, signs. And so the first is the sudden onset of weakness on one side of the body compared to the other. The sudden onset of difficulty walking or feeling unbalanced. The sudden onset of difficulty seeing out of one or both eyes. Sudden onset of difficulty speaking uh, or slurred speech, as well as the sudden onset of severe headache. And, and Sean mentioned that as one of his uh, symptoms in the beginning. Next slide. And so the risk factors for stroke, we actually divide those into factors that are non-modifiable, meaning those that we can't do anything about, and those that are modifiable. And uh, there are very few uh, or fewer um, non-modifiable risk factors. Stroke does increase with age, although as we're talking about today, there are a lot of young people that have strokes as well. I've seen a lot of young people with strokes. Uh, it's more common in men compared to women. However, um, so that's the incidence, the incidence of stroke or new cases is higher in men. However, the prevalence or the number of people in a society at a particular time is higher for women 
And that's because men tend to die and have more devastating strokes and women tend to live longer. Uh, and then I mentioned the um, race ethnic uh, disparity that we have in stroke. And so our African-Americans, Hispanics have higher rates of stroke. But by far, the number one modifiable risk factor for stroke is uncontrolled high blood pressure. Uh, the attributable risk is the term that we use in epidemiology is quite high because high blood, uncontrolled hypertension is very prevalent. One in every three adults actually has uncontrolled, has high blood pressure. One in every three has high blood pressure. 50% of those have high blood pressure, know it, and may be on medication for it, but still aren't under control. And so that's important to know. So we really have to know the numbers. And then I have other risk factors as well for uh, cardiovascular disease and stroke. Next slide. And so the impact of uncontrolled high blood pressure. Now, high blood pressure is also known as the silent killer because most people don't know that they have uh, uncontrolled hypertension or, or high elevated blood pressure. But that chronic uncontrolled blood pressure, it leads to um, damage to the walls of the blood vessel throughout your body. And so here in this schematic, we see some of the major areas that are impacted by this uncontrolled hypertension. You can get blocked arteries in your legs or your lower extremities, and this can lead to amputations of those legs or what we call claudication or pain in the legs when you walk. It can cause uh, kidney damage, so it can lead to uh, inability to produce urine leading to dialysis or kidney, the need for a kidney transplant. It can cause an enlarged heart or cardiac ab abnormalities or heart disease or um, heart attack. Also narrowing of arteries in the neck, which can lead to stroke. And then also uh, this uncontrolled hypertension leads to damage in the brain. The other thing that's not presented here is can also uh, impact the reproductive system as well, because you have blood vessels that go to that area of the body as well. Next slide. And so here I'm showing you, this is an MRI and it's uh, flare images, and it shows the impact of that chronic uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, and this is a pattern that we call periventricular non-specific periventricular white matter disease. And we see this more commonly in people who have uncontrolled hypertension. We can actually score it. And so um, you can see there in the red that this is being scored. And so this is um, moderate to very severe um, uncontrolled hypertension with this damage. This kind of damage actually impacts your cognition and your memory. And so this is what we'd like to prevent. Next slide. So, the normal blood pressure should be less than 120 over 80. So just a, a quick sort of overview of blood pressure. Your, your, your body is like a closed system. If you think of, uh, of a, a system with uh, fluid going through it with a pump that's pumping some type of fluid, in this case, your body and blood through those pipes, when that, um, when that system contracts, it's gonna increase the pressure inside of that system. And when it relaxes, it's gonna go down. So that's what happens when the heart contracts, it increases that pressure inside of your blood vessels. And when it relaxes, it goes down. The top number should not go above 120. And the bottom number when it's relaxing, uh, it should um, be less than 80. It shouldn't be higher than that. Uh, if it's higher than that, uh, if it's 120 to 129, uh, the top number, the systolic number, then that's elevated. If it's um, uh, greater than 80, then that's um, elevated. And you can see 130 to 139, that's considered stage one uh, hypertension. And this is a new uh, blood pressure guideline based upon the results of a study that was funded by the NIH called the SPRINT study. And there's a sub-study of that called SPRINT MIND, where we looked at this impact of uncontrolled blood pressure on cognitive impairment. And we found that people who have blood pressures that are um, higher and not less than 120 over 80, have a higher risk of uh, heart disease, stroke, as well as cognitive impairment later on in life. Next slide. And so it's important, that's why we developed this campaign to mind your risk. Uh, and we're here speaking with you today because black men have the highest rates of uncontrolled hypertension in the United States. I'm gonna say that again for emphasis. Black men have the highest rates of uncontrolled hypertension in the United States. 
and men between the ages of 28 to 45 have the highest risk of developing the long-term complications. I mentioned that um, men tend to die at younger ages uh, from stroke and cardiovascular disease. So if you're a man and you're 28 to 45 and you have a, a stroke and go on and don't get your blood pressure under control, uh, and you have this chronic impact on the blood vessels, your, your risk of developing cognitive impairment and dementia later in life is elevated. And so that's the purpose of this. We'd like to get people that are young age, at this young age to focus on getting their blood pressure control at this point. So that's a double entendre, mind your risk. Next slide. So the other point is that um, self-monitoring of your blood pressure and getting it under control is it's it's totally an individual thing. Nobody can lower your risk of stroke and dementia like you. Uh, we can't say it's the doctor's responsibility, our medical provider, uh, our nurse, our our significant other. It's it's our responsibility. It's an individual responsibility to get your blood pressure under control, and nobody can lower your risk of stroke and dementia like you. Next slide. And so it's important for you to take charge of your health today to prevent your risk of stroke and dementia tomorrow. And just some of the things that you can do is um, to make sure that you keep your blood pressure under that normal range that I talked about, less than 120 over 80. Blood pressure self-monitoring is very important. It's not enough just to get your blood pressure checked when you go to your doctor's office. You should have your own blood pressure monitor. You can buy them at any drugstore uh, and they're automated now. You can should check your blood pressure at least once a week and know what it is. And you can write that down and take it to your doctor's office if it's elevated. You should also um, get your cholesterol under control if it's elevated. Uh, if you have diabetes, make sure that you get your diabetes under control. Smoking is bad. It's associated with most of the top causes of death in this country, and plus it's expensive. So smoking is just not good. Um, you have to keep a healthy diet as well. You should get uh, five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables per day. And it's important to exercise. Um, we should do at least, at least 30 minutes of exercise every day of the week. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people in this country that don't get physical activity in. They do less than that. And just by getting people to move more, we could lower the rates of heart disease and stroke and heart attacks and stroke in the country and deaths. Next slide. And so if you go, we have a website, uh, the Mind Your Risk is the campaign that we have, the Mind Your Risk campaign. If you go to this website that we have here, you can go and get some of the information that I talked about, the one pager explaining what you can do to lower your risk. You can also, um, there's a, a plan that you can go through and sort of determine your own individual risk and write this information down and take this to your doctor. One thing that we found in some of our um, our studies that we've done with, with people, focus groups, we found that uh, people have difficulty having this conversation with their medical providers because oftentimes they're busy and don't have the time to stop and answer questions. So by taking this form, printing it out, filling it out and taking it with you to your medical doctor, that can help spark the conversation to address your blood pressure. And also you'll have a list of those blood pressures from um, the weeks that you can show them uh, to let them know where your blood pressure is running. Next slide. And so we have here, uh, this is a, a video that we've created and all this information you can get at the, um, at the uh, website that I showed you earlier. And I'm sure we'll put the information in the chat if you missed that. But the purpose of this is to get, we want you to share this with your friends, your family members, just to get them all to, um, go to the website and get that information so that we can take charge of our health. So I'm gonna share, share the video now. I'ma shine again. I'ma do some things I never did. Live a life that I'm supposed to live. Wake up as the sun is rising and give thanks again. This summer is a new day dawning. Hold on, it's a new day coming. Next slide. 
So remember, no one can uh, lower your risk of um, stroke and dementia like you. So it's important to take charge of your health. If you go to this and scan this QR code, that'll take you directly to my uh, office website, uh, where if you have questions or you want to get inf more information about some of the things that we're doing, you can do that. And I look forward to having a conversation after the presentation. Now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Raquel Quarles. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Benson. Uh, before we get to Dr. Quarles, we're going to try another poll question. And, you know, that was a lot of good information. So I hope everybody was listening. Um, I knew once my, my classmates from, from NIH said that Dr. Benson was the one to go with, that he was, he was going to come with the, with the real force today. So true or false, the only thing that you can do to prevent a stroke and dementia is to lower your blood pressure. Again, true or false, the only thing you can do to prevent stroke and dementia is to lower your blood pressure. I see some answers coming in. Now let's give it a few more seconds. I think everyone got this one as well. If you selected false, that's the correct answer. In addition to controlling your blood pressure, there are many steps you can take to lower your risk for stroke and dementia, like eating healthy, exercising, and quitting smoking. Now, we're going to hear from Dr. Quarles, who will share ways you can take action now to protect your health for the future. Dr. Quarles, welcome. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, and, and thank you. Um, for Dr. Benson setting me up for what I plan to talk about um, in terms of making sure that you know that you do have the power to lower your risk and giving you some tips on how to do that. So before I start, um, I want to tell you kind of what we do um, here at Morehouse School of Medicine. So next slide, please. So, my research focuses on risk reduction and improving self-management in African-Americans and other minority communities. And our goal in terms of the research that we do is to implement community engaged um, evidence-based strategies in response to those difficult um, and emerging health disparities and equities um, and, and to make those interventions available across the state of Georgia in hopes of improving health equity. Next slide, please. And the way that we do this is through what a term that Morehouse School of Medicine um, coined, um, TX. Um, while there are these traditional freight phases in research um, in translational research, we look at TX or that X um, representing the goal of moving research from translational to transformational. And the way we do it is by engaging and, con and convening researchers um, across the translational community. So the, the, uh, the translational continuum. And so when you look at this image, what we want you to notice is where all of the circles overlap. And so what that means when we talk about these interdisciplinary teams, we're including not only clinic, um, clinicians, clinical um, researchers, um, health science researchers, basic scientists, um, health policy experts, and also community engaged researchers, but in addition, we're also including um, the community. We're engaging the community in the work that we do. And what that results in is adoption and adaptation of these interventions at a quicker pace. And so therefore the outcome of TX is this advancing advancement of health equity, which is really the cornerstone of Morehouse School of Medicine. Next slide, please. And involving the community in the research that we do is really not new to Morehouse School of Medicine. We have a long history of leading in this space of community engaged research and positioning um, community leaders as investigators on the research that we conduct. And we're um, also 
intentional in ensuring that we are disseminating our findings, not only through scientific um, platforms and outlets, but in ways that our community members are able to benefit from our findings. And so what you have here are some examples of our dissemination efforts. So we have where we've done, we do town halls with community members. We of course have written a couple of books and uh, scientific articles, as well as community newsletters. And so we're ensuring that not only the scientific community benefits, but that our um, lay community also benefits. Next slide, please. And so very quickly, I want to share some results of a study that we did some years ago that focused on men in Georgia. We were examining the social determinants of cardiovascular disease um, in Black and white men in Georgia. The study was done using a random digit dial survey where we called um, random people across the state of Georgia, and we used measures that were valid, um, that were used by the Centers for Disease Control survey system. Uh oh, my lights are flickering. There's a storm here in Georgia. I hope that you're still seeing me. Are you still seeing me? Okay, <laughs> we'll keep going. Hopefully I'll get through it. Um, but, um, and, and so we're looking at the social determinants of health, which we know um, are important. And, and when I say social determinants of health, I mean those conditions that um, are the, those environments where people are born, they live, learn, work, play, worship, and age. So where people live life. And um, we were also interested in, in looking at cardiovascular risk factors and, and how those the social determinants of health can affect the cardiovascular um, risk factors. And so for this study, in terms of social determinants of health, what we used were people's education, their employment, um, their income, their annual income. We looked at their stress levels, um, their experience with racial discrimination, um, as well as their experience with um, stress as a result of experiencing uh, race discrimination. In terms of the cardiovascular disease risk factors that we looked at, we looked at obesity, those um, hy hypertension or high blood pressure, diabetes, um, high cholesterol. And then lastly, lastly, we looked to see if they had two or more of these risk factors, these cardiovascular disease risk factors. And what we found was not a complete surprise, um, but we found that those men with lower education who were unemployed had lower income and higher general stress. Um, those were the men who were more likely to have two or more cardiovascular disease risk factors. Additionally, we found that men living in rural areas were nearly twice as likely to have two or more cardiovascular disease risk factors. So this is pointing us where we need to be um, working um, and in helping um, our community members. And then lastly, we saw that urban black men were 2.6 times more likely to have two or more cardiovascular risk factors compared to urban white men. Um, yes, so what that means to us is that we have to be proactive in our behaviors to combat those things that will compromise our health and put us at an even greater risk of early death or a poor quality of life. Next slide, please. And so Dr. Benson earlier um, mentioned the risk factors for cardiovascular disease, and he broke them down into two categories, those things that you can change and those things that you can't change. And so what I have here is a similar list. Um, it's just that it's for risk factors for high blood pressure. And so those things that you can't change are, he's already talked about your race, age, gender, your family medical history, and your personal medical history. Those conditions um, 
certain things that you have already been diagnosed with or experienced. If you already had a stroke, you can't change that. But there are some things that you can change that will have an impact on your outcome, your, your longevity and your quality of life. And so those things that you can change are listed on the screen. Um, tobacco, smoking tobacco, diabetes, high cholesterol, physical inactivity, overweight, your diet, the misuse of alcohol, illicit drug use, stress, and sleep apnea. And so I want to go through and talk about what are some things that you can do. Um, so next slide, please. So first and foremost, um, Dr. Benchin mentioned knowing your numbers. It's important that you know, you monitor the conditions that you have been diagnosed with, monitor them carefully. So when it comes to blood pressure, check your, have your blood pressure checked regularly. If you don't have a blood pressure monitor at home, there are many places in the community that you can go and get your blood pressure taken, be it fire station, pharmacies, um, or at your doctor's office. So, and Dr. Benson already mentioned that there are automated blood pressure um, machines that you can purchase and have at home. And so you definitely wanna monitor your, um, your blood pressure regularly. Diabetes. If you've been diagnosed with diabetes, then you should be checking your blood sugar daily um, at minimum once a day because you want to know where you are. Next with cholesterol, you want to be managing your cholesterol and, and having it monitored when you are visiting your doctor. And then um, a new one, sleep apnea, that many people don't know is that the relationship between hypertension or high blood pressure and sleep apnea. Oftentimes when you treat, if your sleep apnea is treated, it can also lower your blood pressure. And so it's important that you also take your medication as prescribed. Um, oftentimes we don't, realize the importance of taking our medication at the same time every day, that it affects um, your, the conditions you may have. So make sure you're taking your blood, your, your medication um, as prescribed by your doctor. And if there are concerns, side effects that you're not happy with, talk to your doctor about them because Oftentimes there are other medications that you may be able to switch to in order to address some of the side effects. So make sure you're having that conversation with your physician. Next slide, please. What else can you do? Controlling your weight. Um, there are a number of ways that you can control your weight. One of them is healthy eating. So what we don't wanna encourage is uh, crash diets, um, you know, stopping eating. And fortunately, when people go on crash diets, um, they often end up, unfortunately, gaining the weight back when they stop this crash diet. What we're encouraging is that you make a lifestyle change. It's important that you change, you make plans and change your lifestyle for the future. And one um, eating plan that can be considered and that has been shown to be helpful with uh, people particularly who have high blood pressure, but um, it's not just limited to people with high blood pressure because it, it is a healthy eating plan called the DASH diet, which is a study that was done some years ago that was shown to be helpful in improving um, blood pressure control. So the DASH diet or the dietary approaches to stop hypertension eating plan um, is a flexible balanced eating plan that, that helps you create this heart healthy eating style that you should be doing for life. And so consider what changes you can make and sustain. That's really the key, sustaining the changes that you make. 
Um, so think through that. And one of the big things about your eating plan is your portion sizes. Oftentimes people don't realize how much they're taking in. And so there are apps available for your phone to help you to monitor how much you're taking in um, in order to address what um, your weight. Next is physical activity. Nope, nope, go back one. Physical activity, you need to um, increase your physical activity. As Dr. Vincent said, exercising at least 30 minutes a day. And what we've now learned is that even 10 minute increments of physical activity is important and helpful. And then um, last on this slide is reducing your sedentary behavior. So um, what that means is don't sit for hours on end. Um, unfortunately, I know a lot of us have jobs where we are sitting at our desk all day and it's important to get up and get moving at least hourly. Um, there have been some uh, recent studies to come out to show that reducing the amount of time that you're sitting is important and beneficial independent of the amount of physical activity that you're doing. So you want to be doing both. Next slide, please. Next is control unhealthy behaviors. So as Dr. Benson said, if you're smoking, go ahead and quit. Smoking is the single most preventable cause of death. And there are many resources available to help um, if you are interested in quitting. Next is moderate your income, your, um, your alcohol intake. Um, generally, increased alcohol consumption can lead to increases in your blood pressure. So you want to make sure that you're not taking in too much alcohol. Um, and then lastly, if you are, I think you all already know this, right? You're not surprised by this. Um, stop illicit drug use if you are doing it. Next slide, please. And so then the question is, well, why make changes now? If I've lived this long and I'm still alive, why do I need to make any changes now? Well, it's never too late or too early to start making changes. You can prevent stroke, dementia, and cardiovascular disease by making these changes. And then and so it's important to, for your future life that you begin making changes as soon as you can. And then it becomes a question of, well, what's your why? Do you have a why to make those changes? Perhaps it's so that you can be around for your children. Perhaps it's that you can be able to be active and not having um, to be stuck in a sedentary place um, when you're older. And so maybe you have some bucket list activities that you want to do, going on trips um, that you may not be able to do if you are ill. And so your quality of life is affected or can be affected based on the changes that you make. And so I would ask you, what's your why to make changes? So I'm going to ask if you can put in the chat, what's your why for making changes in your life? I'm looking. I see. Family. Wife. Myself. Family. Living longer and active life. Yeah. Thank you all for, for starting. I see them coming in. And so thinking through 
what's your why? And let that be your motivation for making the changes so that you don't um, develop um, heart disease, you don't have a stroke, that you don't, and it may be that, you know, some people are, are more concerned with that they may die, that they'll die if they have um, continue with this condition, you know, because the, the mortality rates are, um, at, you, you're at risk of dying of early death, but you're also at risk of developing dementia. And so the, what's that quality of life like if you develop dementia as a result of things that you could have done. So I would encourage you to begin thinking about how you can get started. Next slide, please. And so I would suggest how, you, how do you get started? One step or one goal at a time. Set SMART goals for yourself. SMART goals using that acronym specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. So set SMART goals, start small. Remember, you didn't get here overnight. You didn't get to this um, weight overnight. You didn't get to this age overnight. And so you can't make all of your changes overnight. So start small, start with one goal at a time and be specific with that goal. And so maybe the goal is to, you know, set an alarm to make sure you take your medication as prescribed at the same time every day. In terms of um, physical activity or, or reducing your sedentary behavior, I'm gonna set an alarm on my watch to make sure I get up and walk around at least once an hour. So set goals for yourself, but then also seek help. There's a lot of help out there to assist you and to help you to make these changes. And so Dr. Benson talked about um, the Mind Your Risk um, website that has a lot of tools and resources available. And NIH website has a lot of tools and resources available. So seek out those resources um, to help you make those changes. Next, accountability partners can be very helpful. And for those of you that are married, it may or may not be your spouse. It may be a friend that can be your accountability partner to help you to engage and, and become, begin to make these changes in your life. Next is expect setbacks. They happen, but you can start over. You can start again. So if you have a setback today, guess what? If you are blessed to have another day, you can start again tomorrow. And so expect those setbacks so they're not, they don't shake you to the core and throw you completely off. Just get up the next day and start again. And then lastly, but I think it's kind of important, is celebrate your success along the way. Celebrate when you make those changes as you are making them every day. Celebrate your success. You've got to believe that you can do it. And if you believe it, then you're halfway there. And so I wish you all the best in making these changes, these lifelong changes. Next slide. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Dr. Quarles. I mean, you're going to be Reverend Dr. Quarles after this. That was a sermon right there. I don't know if these people are listening. I, I've had to do all of those things. I've had to exercise and make sure I walk around this campus once a day. Uh, doesn't matter how hot it is, if it's raining like it was today. I got <laughs> alarms all through my phone. The alarm for the morning, make sure you get some fruit. The alarm at lunch, the alarm at dinner time. Had to talk to my doctor because the medication was messing with my appetite. He said, stop taking it in the morning take it at night. So now I got an alarm after I eat dinner to take my medication. These are things that people, if you don't talk to your doctors, if you don't talk to people uh, and let them know what's going on, they're never going to get the answers that you need to be successful. I had to lose about 25 pounds to get back down to the slim, almost track star Morehouse College look that I have now. And, you know, I'm going to go talk to Coach Hill and see if I still got a year eligibility because I might have to, might have to help him with that four by two. But, you know, it took a lot of work and I had people 
who were family who were helping. I had people who were friends who were helping. And I think it's important that we make sure that we use our community to, to help uplift us when we're in our time of need. So Dr. Quarles, thank you. Uh, to everyone else, you have one more chance at a poll question, which I'm sure you see here. Our final question is true or false. Preventing stroke and dementia is most effective if you start later in life when you are most at risk. And I'm sure you all know the answer to that already, but let's give it a second. I see answers coming in. It looks like once again, everybody was paying attention. Lots of good information. Um, so our answer, false. Start early. Preventing a stroke, heart disease, and dementia is more effective when started in midlife. And I would say start as early as possible. Uh, share this information with the young men in your lives. Uh, I worked K through 12 for about 20 years, and I shared a lot of my health risks as well as my health successes with them as I had them. So I think it's very insightful information, and it was really important that you share it with the young people in your life as well. So now what we're going to do is uh, open up this, this panel to a Q&A. Uh, any questions that you might have, please put in the Q&A section. You'll see it in the bottom bar of the uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, you should be able to type right in there. And uh, you'll, you'll be able to get some questions up and we can have both of our, our panelists answer. I did see a question. Um, one question asked about the, the session being recorded and yes it is going to be recorded and i see a question about urban and how we were defining urban and and we split it down the middle so urban was living in the city in a metro area so um people that were living in the metro atlanta um counties um and those um people living in out, even those outlying counties of major cities versus those um, counties that have been designated as rural in Georgia for my study. Thank you. Uh, I see another question here. Talk about the importance of load, lowering sodium intake. Um, I, uh, something like light popcorn with lower calories can mask sodium. Uh, what, what, do you, what should people be looking for when they're going to the grocery store and picking up different food for their diets? I, I can take that one. That, that's an excellent question. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Quarles for that excellent presentation. Uh, motivates me again. I'm going to get out and run around <laughs> before the end of the day <laughs> myself. Um, sodium is important. I, I, I like to use the analogy of, of sodium being like a sponge. I mentioned earlier that your body's like a closed system of pipes with the heart that sort of pumps fluid through those pipes. And so if you can imagine sodium is like a sponge and it's going to, um, it's going to attract or pull water with it. So the higher or the more sodium that you have in your your diet, the more um, water you're going to retain. A lot of the um, diuretics or medications that are used to, or antihypertensives that are used to lower your blood pressure are diuretics. And some of them work by stopping your body from absorbing sodium in the kidneys and those kinds of things. So it's important to have a, a, so, a diet low in sodium. I, I say just totally not keep a salt shaker. Don't, I mean, you can use it for decoration, but uh, don't put salt in it <laughs> and don't add salt to the to food after it's cooked. And hopefully, you know, while you're cooking, don't put a whole lot of salt because uh, blacks tend to be more salt sensitive. Um, there are a lot of suspected reasons for that, but we tend to eat sodium and, and tend to retain the sodium, retain the fluid and, the low, and it raises our blood pressure. And I, I'd just like to jump in and, and say that when you are, actively trying to lower your sodium, you really do have to be reading the labels um, on the things that you eat because it's snow. <laughs> um, food can sneak sodium in it. I mean, so while you, if you were to compare, you would probably think that potato chips versus pancakes, that potato chips surely would have more sodium, but actually it's pancakes that have more sodium. And so what we've noticed is it's often those prepared foods as opposed to the fresh fruits and vegetables that you are cooking yourself 
um, that are going to have more sodium. And so when you're thinking about um, your diet and how you're preparing your food, think about the source of your food in terms of are you getting it from a can versus frozen vegetables. Canned foods, they're in order to make things uh, shelf stable, you need a preservative. And usually that preservative is sodium. So I often encourage people to switch from canned goods to frozen um, vegetables to actively lower that sodium intake. Yeah, and there was a question about that. Um, would you address strategies people can use to prepare their own foods so they are able to reduce sodium? I know um, as a self-proclaimed chef, at least in my household, uh, I, I try to use as many fresh things as possible. So instead of buying, let's say a pasta sauce or um, a spaghetti sauce, I make my own with tomatoes that I buy. And, and that way I don't have any extra sweeteners or salts that are in there. It's only the amount of seasoning and spice that I put in. So that's one way you can do it. If it's something that simple, um, other times, if I'm making a shake at home before I leave for work, I use the, the fresh fruits and vegetables that are in the house. So I'll buy the spinach, I'll buy the apples, the pears, the strawberries, what have you. It also makes you go through that stuff because it's not going to last as long. It reminds you every morning, hey, I can't leave these bananas sitting here. So I would say just buy more fruits and vegetables that are fresh in moderation, of course, things have gone up in price these days and uh, make sure that you're actually using it. And if you don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, because you know, recognizing that food deserts exist, um, then the the frozen is is an alternative because it lasts a little longer than the fresh. If you're not able to get through, purchase fresh and get through it, and you don't want to waste um, the food, that's where that alternative of of frozen may be an option for you. But I completely agree, Sean, that it's. If you are, you know, they call it clean living, where you're going straight from the, the fruit and vegetable yourself, as opposed to something in a can or a jar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question we have here is what exactly is dementia and how is it related to high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera? Um, great question. So dementia is... Um, Dementia is a general term um, of someone that has uh, a loss of uh, cognition and multiple domains of uh, executive function and other things. That's sort of a long-winded <laughs> answer, but you have, in addition to loss of memory, you have other things in terms of your, your thinking, um, your uh, ability. So if you ask someone, if you're walking down the street and you see a letter on the ground with a stamp on it, what would you do with it? Um, and uh, they don't know what to do with it. So, uh, and loss of executive function. And there are other things that go along with it, but it's a general term. There are a lot of things that can cause dementia. Um, and so we're focusing on those, um, those things that we can prevent, preventable causes of dementia. There are certain forms of dementia that are genetic, that are inherited. And then there's other forms of dementia um, that uh, are related to other things. Alzheimer's is one that people uh, know about. That's one type of dementia, but there are other things that cause dementia as well. And so that's a, that's sort of a loaded question, um, but that's the, the fastest short answer that I can give to, to that question. Thank you. Dr. Quarles, was there anything you wanted to add? No. All right. Uh, our next question, what kind of exercise has been found to be most effective for reducing high blood pressure? the exercise that you can, can um, sustain. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and I think uh, Dr. Quarles made a great point in terms of the 10 minute increment, that, that's important. So um, your 30 minutes a day, you can do them in 10 minute increments, but whatever is gonna get you moving. You don't have to pay to get a expensive gym membership and or buy some expensive equipment in your house. <laughs> you don't have to do any of those things or go back and try to, play football again and break your leg. <laughs> I still got it, Doc. I still got it. Or try to go run track again. And just... <laughs> so I, I, will, I will say we have a brand new track. I know Dr. Quarles has seen it. 
And I, I can't wait till I can get on there. It'd be me and Edwin Moses and, and Jesse Lipscomb and a few of the other uh, uh, classic Olympic level uh, uh, Morehouse Maroon Tiger track and field athletes. It's going to be great. But um, no, I think that you're you're gen- you're definitely correct. Any kind of exercise that you can do, my partner and I actually uh, set goals for ourselves around uh, making sure that we exercise together once a week, and that's been really great for both of us. One in helping us kind of get to know what we can do and not do, and about our health, but also in terms of making sure that we do recognize that it's important to be healthy for your partner. It's important to do these things and say, hey, I'm feeling kind of kind of tired today or I'm feeling kind of, you know, bloated today. And those things help with knowing, okay, well, are we eating right at home? Are we, are we doing the other exercises on our own that we should be to keep up with one another? And many of you said that, you know, your family is a reason, that's your why. So it's, it's helpful to, to make sure that they're involved in that. To that end, we do have another question. What are your recommendations for supporting Black men who are resistant to taking medication or continuing medication when they experience adverse side effects? I said the key, uh, that's a, another great question. I think uh, Dr. Quarles and the work that you guys are doing at Morehouse, I think she gave some really ex- excellent examples of things that you can do in the community. Um, as a medical provider, neurologist, when I dealt with uh, patients with with stroke, particularly African-American men, because uh, some of the medications, the beta blockers, which is one class of medication, it can sometimes cause um, uh, difficulty with, uh, hopefully we're all adults here, so I'm Mm going to say difficulty with erections and those kinds of things. And so uh, people will stop taking their medication for that reason which in the long run is going to end up causing more harm than, than good by not taking those medications. But then the thing is that if you go back and you have this conversation with your medical provider, um, it could be just uh, a matter of changing the medication to something to uh, an angiotensin receptor blocking agent or ARB or uh, an ACE inhibitor or a calcium channel blocker. And so there are other medications that you can use that don't have those side effects. Um, but again, as Dr. Quarles can talk, I mean, you have to find out where the person feels comfortable and what they need to do. Unfortunately, some medical providers don't take that time. I do that because I think that it's important to, to do that, particularly uh, I understand African-American men. Um, but having that conversation and finding out what the resistance is and then trying to change behavior. I, I completely agree. I think you have to meet the person where they are. And, and um, some people aren't um, ready to be told what is best for them. And so maybe it's, it's starting with a conversation on what their concerns are. But then that's also why I ask the question about what's your why? Are you concerned about being, you know, what I've heard from um, older um, family members is they don't want to be a burden on on, on their kids or, or, or whoever. And so, you know, if that is a concern of yours, maybe that's a why to get started now and making changes now. And so what is the motivation? What motivation can get someone to, to make those changes? And what we have learned from research is that shaming people um, and it is not the way to go about it. Um, so it's, it's encouraging, um, giving them the information that they may um, have questions about, give them the information that they need in order to make decisions. You know, it's better to make, um, and that's why I say start small. And so maybe they're willing to, you know, set one goal, one small goal, start with that. And then um, once that goal is, is rolling and, and they're doing well with that goal, then talk about what are some other goals? Because it may be that they're just not interested in doing what you think that they should be doing, but there are some other behavior changes that they're willing to do and, and actually interested in doing, but it requires a conversation. 
All right. Well, thank you. Uh, we're a little bit over time, not by too much, but it is just after 730. So we're going to go ahead and close out. That's going to conclude our event for today. Again, we want to extend a special thank you for joining us tonight. We hope this webinar was one small way for, to help you prioritize uh, your health and men's health month. We'll be sending out a very short survey to get your feedback on tonight's event so that we can make sure that webinars we host with other HBCUs are helpful. Uh, please take a moment to complete it. We appreciate your feedback. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening.